We have students of Future Flipper. We have a couple guys who made $3 million flipping houses on the MLS. So there's actually not a point where you need to do direct to seller marketing. There is plenty of deals to make on the MLS and with wholesalers. I think last year we grossed like 1.5 million just off the MLS. But let's just say you do want to go to direct to seller. You could do things like cold calling, mass text messaging, ringless voicemail, mail, driving for dollars, knocking on doors, bandit signs. There's probably a good 10 ways that you could find deals at all times. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back. Today, we've got a very special guest. His name is Brian Davila. Uh, he is the COO of Future Flipper. He is a real estate agent, investor, house flipper, coach, mentor. And today, he's going to be covering with us how to flip a house step by step. So he's going to be teaching us everything as to how to raise money, how to find good opportunities, what to do, what not to do. Welcome to the show, Brian. How are you? I'm super excited to be on here with you. And I'm not really a real estate agent anymore, but I have a license, but I don't really consider myself a real estate agent. But yeah. Good, man. So uh, for those people who don't know who you are, who is Brian mm -hmm. Villa? And then how did you get involved in the world of real estate first? And then how did you get involved in the world of real estate investing? Brian Davila is a Puerto Rican 31 year old from Southern California. I was born in Puerto Rico, moved to Las Vegas when I was like five years old. I dropped out of high school, probably like around the ninth grade, around when I was like 19. Uh, I started going to college and um, part time, though, and I was going to school for sociology. And at the same time of going to college, I was working two jobs. So I was doing that till I was like 24. And I quickly saw that there was not a lot of money to be made uh, in the field that I was in. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced into a real estate agent around 24 years old. He inspired me to get my real estate license and I dropped out of high school or dropped out of college. So I dropped out of high school, then dropped out of college and got my real estate license and became a realtor. So that's kind of my journey into real estate. And then as it relates to house flipping, did you begin to flip houses immediately or at what point did that come into um, play? Yeah. So I got, so got my real estate license, um, since 2015, sold a bunch of houses and then around, I think it was 2017 on new year's, I really decided that I did not enjoy being a realtor. And I decided that I was going to need a change because I wasn't going to be able to do this for the rest of my life. So I decided that I needed to get into house flipping. So 2018 was the year that I started to make the pivot from realtor to real estate investor. And I, I think that's a pivot that not a lot of agents end up making, you know, like it's oh, no. surprising how many agents there are, but how many of them do very little investing and how many yeah. of them actually own Airbnbs or rentals. So this show is going to be all about helping you guys, real estate agents, clients, consumers, helping you guys learn how to flip property. So let's say that I wanted to flip my first property. Where would I start? Okay. So if you wanted to flip your first property, it's going to vary per person. Like for example, for me, I was a realtor. So I had a very thorough understanding of real estate. So there's a lot of people who they literally don't know nothing about real estate and then they want to flip houses. That's a lot harder of a position to start. So I'll start off first as like a realtor. Mm -hmm. So if you're a realtor and you're listening, you're listening to this and you want to start flipping houses, what I would first do is connect with people who are currently flipping houses in your market. That would be the easiest way to start understanding the metrics or very simple first step is start looking for current flips in your market. And then you could check realist or the tax records, see who flipped the house and start networking with those people. Or you could check the tax records and see what they bought the house for and then what they ended up listing the house for and then what they ended up selling the house for. So you could kind of get an idea of what the average purchase price 
or average spread you need when you're like flipping a house in your market? That would be like the very first step. So basically look on the MLS if you're a real estate agent and kind of just look at properties that have been flipped and then mm-hmm. kind of reverse engineer it and maybe even make contact with the person who's flipping it to try 100%. to build some sort of uh, relationship. Now, some people would say, well, why would I reach out to the person that just flipped the property? Are those people going to be willing to share any information? What would you say to that? Hopefully people listening to this have common sense, right? So common sense says when you're reaching out to someone, if you're going to ask something, you also need to give something. Mm -hmm. So if someone reaches out to me, I'm a house flipper and they say, Hey, I saw you flip this house. I'm interested in getting into flips. I'd say, great. What they could do to benefit me is say, Hey, if I bring you a deal, can we partner on it? Or do you have a listing agent that flips that list your house. I'll list your house for free or offer something, offer some sort of value. And most agents are so closed minded. And I always say real estate agents, they live in a box, right? They live in the little box that their broker put them in. And if, if I were to tell some real estate agents, Oh, list a house for free so they could teach you, they would say, Oh, absolutely not. Because then I, they're not valuing me and, you know, that's, that's, you know, I, I need 3% or whatever. Like you can't go into investing with the same mindset as a realtor. It's a completely different business. It's ran completely different. So I would say if you're going to reach out to those people, try to offer them something, even if it's listing their house for free, uh, it could be bringing them your first deal. It could be sharing whatever resources you have, just figure out what you could do to provide value when you're reaching out to these people. The other thing, like, what if I am a newbie? What if I don't have any experience with real estate? What if I just own the property where I live, but I've seen like HGTV, like flip the house, right? Read no. some books on flipping houses. What, what advice would you give to somebody in that position? I would say to someone in that position, you always have something to offer, right? So for example, for me, I need help with content, right? Like I suck at content. I'm great at flipping houses. I effing suck at content. So if someone reached out to me and said, Hey, I could help you with content to me, that's valuable. I'm like, Hey, great. I need help with, I need help with accounting, right? I'm flipping 20 plus homes at a time. I have 300 million things going on at once. I don't have time to sit here on QuickBooks and like bullshit with QuickBooks and stuff like that. But if someone reached out and said, Hey, I'm really good at accounting. I see you run a business. Do you need help with that? That's value, right? Like that's very valuable. So don't think just because you don't know about real estate, you have nothing to offer. Because honestly, if you contact me trying to teach me about real estate, that's not valuable, valuable to me at all in my position. I don't need to learn more about real estate. I need other things. And what would be the goal when you reach out to these individuals? Would it be to go work for them and kind of learn from them? Would it be to just have them sit down with you for a lunch? Uh, Is it to build a relationship with them? What would you say the goal is when you're a realtor networking with other investors? And what would you say the goal is for somebody doing that? I would say the worst thing you could do is reach out to someone and ask them to have lunch with you. I would rather jump off a bridge than go to lunch with a random person. I'm a grown ass man and I don't want to go to lunch with random people for nothing. So I would never reach out and ask someone to go to lunch or go to coffee. I would reach out and with the intent of providing value in return for them to teach you about real estate investing or at least how to go about getting your first deal. So maybe even like shadowing them, some of their projects, how they acquire property and uh, uh, how they go about the remodel process and kind of almost like for me, when I was a re- uh, starting off as a realtor, it was helpful for me to see somebody else producing at high levels. And that kind of like opened my eyes. So maybe like to see it firsthand, like, hey, there's somebody yeah. else doing it. It's possible. Now I can do it. So let's say that uh, you do reach out to the people. They kind of give you some guidance. What would be the first step in acquiring the first deal? Yeah. So I guess like if you're starting off and you have no real estate experience, I would start off on market. Um, That's probably going to be the most simplest way to start looking at deals. And on market, I also include wholesalers because wholesalers kind of like get the deal and then put it out there for people to 
to look at. So I would say start looking on the MLS for distressed properties. And then kind of like what I said before, start tracking what they go under contract for, what they sold for, what they end up reselling for. Um, so I would say start looking on the MLS, Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, and then also networking with wholesalers. Yeah, that would be the like the two easiest, and they're both free. So that's where I would start. And for the viewers, like maybe somebody doesn't know what a wholesaler is. What What is a wholesaler and how do you find them? So a wholesaler is someone who finds distressed properties. They'll get the homeowner to sign a purchase contract, and then they will assign that contract for a profit. So simple math is they'll get a homeowner to sign something for a hundred K they'll then turn around and sell it to someone like myself for 120 K. So they'll make a 20 K profit for selling me a, a flip property. And then where you would go about finding them, you could go to your local RIA meetups. You could go on Facebook. They have Facebook groups for wholesalers and um, wholesalers hang out with other wholesalers. So if you find one, I guarantee you that person knows other wholesalers. So you would use the power of networking to start building a list of wholesalers. And that's a free way. So like what Brian is referring to, they do all the marketing and they're basically making a profit on it, but they're leaving meat on the bone for somebody like you to still flip it and make a profit as well too, which I think is great advice. Now, let's say I find a deal, but let's say I don't have any money, you know, like, yeah. I mean, it almost seems like for some people, like I get people that say, Hey, Jose, I want to flip houses. But the first thing that they focus on is always the money part. That's always like, well, I don't have any money. I, 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 I'm not, I don't come from a rich family. I don't have access to money. Is it more important to find the deal first and then find the money? Or is there a way to find some money and then a deal? Or do you have to know how you're going to finance it before you find it? I, I, and I understand. And sometimes I'm like a little like sarcastic. Like I understand when, when people are starting off, it's like super confusing, but always you could do both. That would be the simple answer. Like, you know, you, it's not like you could look for deals and not also look for money at the same time. So obviously you should look for both, but I would put more energy, time and effort into finding deals because finding money is a lot easier. So let's just say, for example, if you're in Southern California and you find a good deal, I'll partner with you. I'll put up a hundred percent of the money. Now that whole money issue that you thought you had is gone. Now you're stuck looking for deals, which is the hard part. Finding money is easy. Finding deals is more difficult. And I think that's the part that a lot of people get caught up on. But if you have a deal, the money will come. But like, let's say that they didn't, for whatever reason, want to partner with with Brian Davila. And let's say that they yeah. wanted to do it on their own. Or let's say they did, didn't want to partner with Jose Luis, which, are, which, which is an option to partner with Brian. But what if they didn't want to? How else can they finance a deal? Do they have to have a cash? Yeah. Uh, can they do it on an equity line of credit? Do they have to get a hard money loan? Yeah. Uh, what, what are the other options that people have at their disposal? Yeah. So let me say this, right. And there are people like that who, who say, Oh, I don't want to partner. I want to do it by myself. Right. But the problem with doing it by yourself is Jose, you could make a lot of money, real estate investing, right? Lose. And you could also lose a lot of money. This is not a low, a no lose game, right? I've seen people lose $200,000 several times. Not like, oh, one time I met someone. I've met several people who have lost a lot of money buying deals that they think, oh, this is like a 30K rehab. And that 30K rehab ends up being $150,000 and six to 12 months of headache. So for me, my first deals, I partnered and I was happy to do it because I'm like, dude, if, if I could save potentially going bankrupt on my first deal, I'll do it. Because like I said, you could lose a lot of money. You could go bankrupt on your first deal. And I've seen it. I, I coach students at future flipper. I've had students hit me up and say, Hey, I bought this house and there's no foundation. And the city said, I have to knock it down. <laughs> like That sucks, right? That's a very real scenario that happens. But okay, let's just say you don't want to partner. So what you could do is reach out to a hard money lender. Uh, some huge ones that I work with are Kiavi, it's K-I-A-V-I, or Anchor Loans. And they will give you a hard money loan, which is going to be an interest-only loan that you you have 12 months 
to pretty much buy the house, fix it up and resell it. They're usually going to ask for somewhere between 10 and 20% down. They're going to charge one to 3% of the purchase price up front. And they're going to charge you between like seven and 10% interest. So you would calculate that by taking the loan amount times the interest rate and then divide that by 12 months. That's what your monthly payment would be. How do I know what a good deal looks like? You know, like, uh, like yeah. I, I had people reach out to me and they're like, oh, this is a perfect flip. And before I, we get into that, I want to agree with you that you can lose money. My very first flip, Brian, <laughs> I got, I didn't lose money, but I turned a great deal into an okay deal. I over rehabbed it. The rehab took like six months versus like two to three months. The marketplace shifted in the middle of my flip, meaning prices started coming down because interest rates went up and I ended up making like 30,000 bucks, which is not bad, but I could have made, had I known what I know now, I probably could have made like a good 60 to $70,000 on that first property. So I turned a great deal into a okay deal, but how do you know if it's a great deal or not? Like, am I just looking for the worst condition property out there? Or am I looking for, uh, can I flip something that maybe is already remodeled? Like, does it have to be a fixture? Yeah. So that's kind of where it goes back to the very first step where I said, looking at what other deals look like in your market. And then like, when you, when you reach out to that initial person, you should see what is their average deal profit. And then, you know, as you start networking, you start understanding what other investors are profiting in your market. So you know what to go for. Like, so for example, so I know students in Hawaii or members of Future Flipper in Hawaii, right? Their average deal size is 100K. That's their average because of that. That's the market, right? In Southern California, the average deal size is usually around 10% of the purchase price or more. So once you start understanding what's the average profit, then when you're looking at deals, you could kind of see if it's a good deal or not. And that's average profit for a flip, not a wholesale. And is there a formula that you follow? I know that like when I was starting off, somebody taught me this and it was like very simple. It was like 85% of ARV minus repairs or 80% of ARV minus repairs. Mm -hmm. And it was like a very simple way of me kind of just looking at the deal and kind of saying, oh, yeah, it somewhat makes sense, you know? Yeah, I don't do that. So Future Flipper, we have a calculator that you would put in profit, rehab, interest, closing costs, uh, selling costs. And I use the calculator. I actually discourage people from doing that 85% or 70% minus rehab because you will miss out on deals. So what I would say is there's a hundred calculators online. You can go to futureflipper.com. There's a free calculator. Um, Bigger Pockets has a calculator. Just put in house flipping calculator online. There's a hundred, pick one, learn how to use it and take the time to calculate each house. Because if you miss, if you put a hundred offers in and you miss one, that's a $60,000 mistake, right? If there was a house you could have bought and you missed it, that's a 60K mistake. So mm -hmm. use a calculator that's the best way to run deals. It's funny because uh, we recently started using a calculator and it adds so much clarity now. It adds like, okay, like this is what you're projected to make. This is the cash on cash return. This is how much money you're gonna need. This is how much your carrying cost is gonna be. And it just makes it a lot simpler. In terms of the underwriting uh, process, like how do you know how much repairs a property needs? Like what tips would you give somebody in terms of the rehab cost? And also in terms of the people that are doing the work, that's, I think, one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle right there. Again, it would kind of be where the first part, when you reach out to that initial investor, you would ask, like, what's the average rehab? So uh, uh, a quick answer for Southern California, the average rehab costs usually 30 to $50 a square foot, depending on how bad the condition is. But like for an average, we're looking at like $30 a square foot um, for a cosmetic rehab. So that would mean like, let's just say the house is a thousand square feet times 30. I believe that's like 30,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would add on if it needs a roof, that would be separate or foundation that would be separate. But for all cosmetic inside rehabbing, you're looking at around $30 a square foot. So easiest way to find contractors, you could go to stores like Lowe's, Home Depot. Um, let's just say, for example, you are you need an electrician. 
you would go to a, an, a, sto- a store that sells electrical equipment, you know, hang out out front, pass out business cards, pick up business cards. Let's say you need a painter. Go to Sherman Williams or whatever other paint, Dunn Edwards. Go to that store. Wait there. You're gonna. There's going to be workers who are coming in and out buying materials. So that's usually the best place. And then referrals, I would say, is like the number one place to find great construction workers. What does it typically take like time-wise to flip a property? Like, okay, like from the time you acquire it, what would, what is an ideal time for maybe some of your students and also like for, for you? There's no certain time because you're always working on other people's schedules unless you are the one physically rehabbing the house. So for me, you know, we're doing 20 projects at a time. I have four crews that I'm working with who are constantly fixing and, you know, moving on to the next property. But if you're just starting off, uh, you are probably going to have to work around the schedule of the contractor. But another easy formula that I use is usually it's a thousand dollars a day. So let's just say it's a $30,000 rehab. That rehab should take 30 days. If it's a hundred thousand dollar rehab, it's probably going to take around a hundred days. That's usually a good baseline. Ah, I like that. So it basically kind of tells you based on the amount of money that you're investing, how much time it should take basically. Exactly. So like, let's just say it's a $10,000 rehab that shouldn't take 30 days. It's, you know, it's like, why would it? It's only $10,000 worth of work. It doesn't take a month to do $10,000 worth of work. I feel like 10 days is very appropriate. Let's say if you want to like build a business out of it, like eventually, like as you progress, you're going to add other sources of finding deals. Like when you're starting off, obviously, MLS is a good option. Uh, Wholesalers is a good option. Doesn't cost you anything. But for somebody like you, do you do direct to seller marketing? And what is that? And is that something at what point in someone's business would they incorporate something like that we have students future flipper we have a couple guys who made three million dollars flipping houses on the mls so there's actually not a point where you need to do direct to seller marketing there is plenty of deals to make on the mls and with wholesalers i think last year we grossed like 1.5 million just off the mls but let's just say you do want to go to direct to seller you could do things like cold calling mass text messaging ringless voicemail mail driving for dollars, knocking on doors, bandit signs. There's probably a good 10 ways that you could find deals at all times. It's funny because a lot of times people want to go direct to seller because they think that they're going to get a better deal or something like that. But there are so many deals on the MLS if you just look and they're available. Walk us through that process. You find a deal on the MLS. Uh, What do you do? So now my process is a little bit different because I have acquisition managers, but let's just say when I was starting off, I would reach out to someone and uh, uh, a listing agent and say, hey, I see you have this house listed in Ventura for 500. Can you represent me to buy this property? If they say yes, I say perfect. Uh, You know, based on my numbers, I need to be somewhere around 450. Do you think that's possible? Yeah or nay to say yes, I would immediately say, hey, can you send me the purchase contract because I'm ready to move on this now and let's get this into escrow immediately. And that way I can get into escrow and then I could start my own due diligence. And then if it works, I will proceed to buy it. And if it doesn't, then I will cancel escrow. And then at this point, have you kind of just ran your numbers like preliminary based on the pictures that you see online and based on some comps or have you seen the property at this point in in some cases? No. So I never go look at the properties. Even when I was starting off, I understood that I would be wasting time, especially in Southern California. Like it takes 45 minutes to get somewhere, look at it and then come back, you know, and then call the listing agent. That's like two, three hours of time just wasted. And then obviously, if it's a fixer-upper, the house needs to be work, right? The house needs work. I don't need to look (laughs) and see that the house needs work. That's why I'm buying it. So I'm already anticipating that I'm going to have to fix up the house, you know? And the major stuff, like, okay, I'll go check if I see any foundation issues or if I think the whole electrical system needs to be rewired. But on some of the, let's just say you see a house built in the 1920s and it looks original. Guess what? It probably needs new electrical. Mm -hmm. probably needs new plumbing. I don't need to physically go look at it and say, yeah, this house is a piece of shit. Like I was right. Like 
I, I, I just anticipate that it's going to need a full rehab. So here's one of the mistakes that I see a lot of people do when they go straight to the listing agent. They they almost like treat the listing agent like they're doing them a favor by oh going my god the listing agent. But I can't believe I, you brought that up. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, it, I almost feel like the way to look at it is like no, the listing agent can actually help me make money and be nice to them. You know, so yeah. one of the biggest mistakes that I see from consumers is that they go straight to the listing agent, but they're trying to either beat up the listing agent on their commission or they're trying or, or even difficult clients, like not knowing that your reputation follows you around. So meaning like that listing agent, uh, like my goal, whenever I go straight to a listing agent, I tell them up front, I'm going to be the easiest investor that you've ever worked with in your life. And the mm -hmm. reason I tell them that is I want them to bring me their future deals. You know, I want them to call me before they list the property on the MLS and say, man, Jose was the easiest investor I've ever worked with. So what approach do you take with uh, with listing agents and what is your thought uh, on uh, working directly or, or why work directly with the listing agent if you find a good enough opportunity? Yeah. So really quick, I think that's so funny that you brought that up. I've never heard of someone else mentioning that, I think, because. I was a realtor, so I experienced that myself where investors would call me and say, hey, uh, I'm going to give you the opportunity to invest or to double end this deal. And, you know, I'm going to you, you're you know, you should be grateful that you're getting both sides of the commission. And I'm like, dude, obviously, like, obviously, you're only doing that because you want the deal. And yeah. obviously, you're not the you're not a genius here. You're not the only person offering to let me double end it. So I would actually get offended by it. And I would think, Hey, this guy's an a, you know what? Like, and I'm yeah. not going to work with them because yeah, I'm not, there's a hundred other investors I could work with. But, um, so, uh, what was your question? I guess what I would say is the reason I work with listing agents directly is because the listing agents have the power and they kind of have direct contact with the seller so I rather work with that person. There's no need for me to bring in another agent unless the listing agent wants that. So I always work with the listing agent. I never work with my own realtor or represent myself. Yeah, it's funny because uh, this last one that we got, we just got our offer accepted on a property in Ventura. And the listing agent first, he says, well, you know what? I've got like 10 other phone calls just like you telling me that they, that they can represent, that they want me to represent them. And I was just like, like, that's okay. I, I'll be the easiest one to work with. I'll be yeah. the easiest investor, you know, you've ever worked with and then follow through on that, you know, and it may take time for you to build up that, that courage to eventually write offers, um, no contingencies, no appraisal. In some cases, we even write them no inspection contingency just to show them that we were serious in the last one. We actually put our entire earnest money deposit from day one basically on the entire purchase just to show them how serious we were and that we weren't going to like nickel and dime them in any way, uh, shape or form. So, um, from let's talk a little bit about future flipper. Uh, what is future flipper and how does it, uh, help, uh, and, and who's your, uh, clients and how does it help people? Okay. So future flipper is a real estate investing education company. Mm -hmm. So Future Flipper has two products that we sell. Uh, one of them is rookie coaching. So that's for people who are just starting off. They don't understand anything about real estate or maybe they understand a little bit, but they haven't done their first deal or maybe they've done one. Maybe they bought their own home, but never flipped the house. So the rookie coaching program, we teach people how to start flipping, wholesaling and buying rentals. The other product we have is is called all-star coaching. Um, so that's for people who have already done a couple of deals or maybe they've done a hundred deals, but they just want to be around more uh, experienced real estate investors. Um, and both of them are year long pro uh, coaching products. So you both pro programs are for one year. Um, we have events, we have coaching calls, we have masterminds. It's it's a really great community of real estate investors. And I'll include a link at the bottom of this. If you guys are kind of curious as to what they have to offer, I'll include a link at the bottom of the video just so that you guys can get connected uh, mm -hmm. with them. Now, what about like whenever they flip the property, 
like let's say that they flipped it it came out successful they made fifty thousand dollars um like do you get to keep all 50 of those thousand dollars do you have to pay taxes on that uh is it better to reinvest that money back into the business how, how does uh, that process work i mean they can do whatever they want i mean for a future flipper they don't pay us anything after the the first like sign up fee but mm -hmm. uh people could do whatever they want to be honest i'm not somebody who says hey you should save your money or you whatever like you can do whatever you want dude it's your house your money um everyone's minds works different Definitely. some people need to go buy the rolex and all the stuff some people don't like i see you're balling you got a rolex i see you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah uh i was asking more in terms of taxes like um oh okay, like, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. yeah uh taxes so of course you're gonna have to pay income tax 100 percent. yeah you're gonna have to pay income tax you're gonna have to stay, pay state tax so you should definitely figure out what your state charges. I know in California, they're trying to add a 25% mm -hmm. investor tax on top of the 50% tax that I'm paying. So I'm like, damn, am I going to pay 75% tax or how's that going to work? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, th I think you should um, ask a local CPA what taxes you're going to have to pay after you flip a house. Cause it varies by state. Anything else that you feel would add value uh, to our viewers as it relates to flipping a property? I think that if you're interested in flipping houses, you have to understand that it is a risky business. It is not an always win business. If you want to lower your risk wholesale, if you wholesale, you're not going to lose any money. If you become a realtor and you list a house and it doesn't sell, you're out a couple hundred dollars. So if you want to lower your, your risk wholesale, be a realtor. I, and I'm telling everyone recently, you know, you can live through faith or you can live through fear. Like, there, you you have the choice. You could be scared every turn, scared of flipping houses, scared the market's going to turn, scared to hire, scared to go on a date, scared to speak on stage. Or you could, you know, say, hey, I'm going to flip a house, win or lose, great. I'm going to hire, win or lose, great. So faith or fear, you can live through either one you want. Absolutely, man. Cool. Well, for all of our viewers, I just want to say thank you uh, for taking the time to watch this. Uh, this was Brian Davila. Uh, Brian, where could they find you uh, if they want to get a hold of you? The best place to reach me is on Instagram. So it's the Brian Davila. Um, there's no dot or anything because I'm starting to get fake accounts now. So make sure it's just the Brian Davila, D-A-V-I-L-A. Cool, man. That means you're growing whenever you start getting the fake accounts, man. That means uh, people are wanting. Yeah, it's crazy. Cool. So uh, this was episode number 118. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this episode would add value to anyone in any way, shape, or form, make sure to hit that subscribe button. As always, we appreciate you guys, and thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And thank you, Brian, for uh, being on the show. We appreciate you, man. Thank you, brother.